Hi guys, now we're going to talk about chapter six. Um, this chapter is all about telescopes and um, there's only a few really important things in this chapter. Um, that's why we're covering three chapters this week. Um, you know, section one talks about telescopes and how they work. Um, this formula in here for the light collecting area of a telescope, it's really useful and um, not really relevant to being a literate, a scientifically literate member of society. So it's not something that I'm going to test you over or expect you to remember three years from now. Um, then it talks about the, the formation of an image by a lens or a mirror. One of the things we want to remember is that the light comes in, it goes through the lens and gets focused. And so what we end up viewing on the other side is upside down. Um, that's why every time you look in a telescope, um, the image is upside down. And with practice, your brain just begins to accept that and you even sort of start to view things right side up just because you know what you're looking at. Um, then talks about the difference between a refractor telescope and a reflector. So refractor means that there's a lens in there of glass. Light comes through, it gets bent at both the, the entry and the exit um, edges by Snell's law, lots of um, physics in here. Um, but, so that's what bends the light. A refractor telescope reflects and so light comes in, it hits a curved mirror, and it gets reflected back and bent at the same time. Um, so those are the two major types of telescopes. Then we come down here and, you know, prime focus, Newtonian focus, Cassegrain focus, those are all just different methods of designing the telescope, putting the lens or the mirror in different places, sticking your eye in different places to make it easier to use. There's a ton of different types of telescope. There's even catadioptric, which means that there's a lens and a mirror. They're all, they're all really useful for different kinds of astronomy. Um, and then, um, Section 6.2 talks about telescopes today and the fact that we've really, for large research telescopes, moved away from those refractors because the glass is so hard to pour, perfectly pure. Um, it's much cheaper and simpler to make mirrors. And so, you know, there's a huge list here of the big telescopes around the world um, and a couple of cool pictures. Um, and I've visited the, the Palomar um, 5 meter in image A. Um, it's really cool. Um, and then some story about George Ellery Hale and how he went about building some of these huge telescopes. Um, the Yerkes 40 inch telescope, um, which is the, the largest refractor in the world. It's up near Chicago. Um, I've been to that one too. It's really awesome. Um, there's a group here in Northwest Arkansas that is trying to build an observatory with a 24 inch refractor telescope. So maybe that'll be available in a couple of years. That would be cool. Um, and then section 6.3 talks about visible light detectors. And this is all about how um, a CCD works. And so a CCD is a charge coupled device. It's the same thing that's inside your digital camera. Um, and that's how we collect astronomy images today. Um, and talks about the various different kinds of light that are available. Um, 6.4 talks about radio telescopes. These are um, getting more and more use because we're getting better and better at um, 
working out what all of the radio imagery or the radio signals mean and how to collect that radio data. The radio waves are very long and low energy, which means they will travel very cleanly through huge distances in space. And so there's a lot of information that we can get from that. Um, it's not as hard to collect as light, but there's very low energy, so you need a ginormous telescope. And the best ones that we use today actually use multiple radio telescopes around the Earth and use computers to combine the data to create an image um, using that, those radio waves. Um, and then there's a whole the list of big radio telescopes um, and radio interferometry is that concept of using you know two small telescopes to create an image and you're sort of manufacturing the the, the data in between from what these two show lots of computers 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 um, observatories outside the earth as we showed in last chapter um, visible light and radio are the only ones that actually get to the surface of the earth so all other kinds of um, radiation need to be collected out in space in order to get the good imagery and so it talks about you know airborne and space-based telescopes the Hubble Space Telescope this image, um, figure five, six point two five. Sorry, um, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Two spots in that image, the two that have the little, it's called a crosshatch, um, points of light sticking out from the the actual source. Those are the only two stars in that image. Every other thing in this image is a galaxy. Um, this guy wanted to point the Hubble at an empty spot in the sky and see what was there. And everybody said, well, that's, you know, really not very smart because there's nothing there. And so they pointed the Hubble Space Telescope at this spot for hours. It's 283 um, images stacked on top of each other to get this image and lo and behold there's 3,000 galaxies in that spot of sky the size of a grain of rice over in the north um, near the Big Dipper um, and then talks about other high energy observatories the Chandra X-ray Observatory is really getting lots of amazing imagery right now and then the future of large telescopes. There's an image of the James Webb Space Telescope, and all you know, it's going to be a compilation of a bunch of mirrors. So it will, once it launches, it will be even bigger than the Hubble, which is a good thing that it's launching soon because the Hubble is nearing the end of its life. So um, we will still have telescopes out there, though. That is chapter six. Thanks.